Hello, welcome back to the Yellow Couch. This is YCFT. That's Yellow Couch Film Talk for those who are not in the know. Mm-hmm. And if you mm-hmm. aren't in the know, join us. Join our little it's community. Like little horror hub. So today we're going back in time to mm. 1935. Yeah. Before colour films, so there is a change I need to make. Mm. I need to learn how to click. There we go. <laughs> I've set, I've set this myself now. If I don't make a black and white, it just looks oh, yeah. ridiculous and all these purple lights are pointless. Absolutely useless. So yeah, we got back to 1935. We want to talk about one of the universal monster films. Yes, we do. Bride. Is it The Bride? It's just Bride. Bride of Frankenstein. Yeah. Because it's important to go... It's important to look back. You can see how far films progressed. Yeah. Like how they used to do things, the changes in storytelling. Plus... All the time there's really good movies. That's when we watched uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon. So it's just a really good film. Yeah. So yeah, it's true. We fancy looking at one of the other horror icons. One Obviously, of the old is ones. a sequel to yes. Frankenstein, starring Boris Karloff. Yes, Boris Karloff, directed by James Whale, who comes back to do Bride of yeah. Frankenstein. He, in, in order to come back, he wanted full creative control, didn't he? He did. Yeah. This film gets a bit weird. Yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> but it's arguably we will a discuss. better film. Than Frankenstein. This this film is highly regarded in most filmmaking circles. I mean, we we've talked about how it is considered a great horror film, but generally in terms of the history of cinema, this film is is lauded as, you know, one of the, the greatest achievements ever made. Um similar to, you know, we talked about the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre in terms of how it's been studied, it's been analysed, academics and critics have, you know, pulled the film to pieces till there's nothing left to discuss. Similar with Bride of Frankenstein. Yeah. This film is talked about a lot. Yeah. And I think I'm right in saying at the time we record this, it has 98% on Rotten Tomatoes. Which is insane. It could send out yeah, and it's a bit. sequel. It is a sequel, yeah. And what I always find interesting, like, we're... It's no secret that we're not massive fans of the book by Mary Shelley. We have issues with we're, I have a lot of issues with it, and I think the film, the original film, fra- uh, corrects a lot of those issues mm-hmm. for me. Interestingly, this, the sequel adds in a lot of aspects that are taken away in the first film from the book, like yeah. the monster being able to speak. Obviously, the bride, the bride is in the book. She's a subplot of the original yeah, She's of a subplot the, of the original the book that was added back in. Yeah. This... And I think... Between the two films, they do the book a lot more justice than it kind of does itself. I, and English literature students are about to destroy me for that. Well, but just it, the book wasn't what I wanted. It, I, I can not self say it's not what I wanted it to be. I just I didn't get that much enjoyment out of reading it. No, that's fine. I mean, you, a, you know, people, something I was very excited to read. I I agree with that. I mean, I I love gothic fiction. I did gothic fiction for my dissertation because I did English lit and film at uni. And yeah, I, I did Frankenstein. I did a few other gothic novels as well. And like Frankenstein is considered one of the first gothic novels. In a lot of ways you can argue it is, in a lot of ways you can argue it isn't. I had the same issues that you did. I found the, the book to be quite kind of meandering. There's not a lot of action in it for the first half. It's very sort of heavily philosophical. Like not a lot of horror stuff actually happens. Yeah. The films, I mean, especially the universal films kind of correct that. Because even in the very first film, the 1931 Frankenstein movie, the very first scene is when Frankenstein and Igor, or Igor, I can never remember which one, yeah, they're, digging, they're digging up the body. He's not actually called Igor in the first one, I don't think. No, no I know not young... established until, like, the third one. I know young Frankenstein, like, they make a big joke out of this, but I can never remember in my head what his assistant is called. But the very first scene in that film is when they, ju- they just jump right to the bit where they're yeah. stealing the body. It's like, you get rid of a lot of, like... You know, the heavy exposition and all of that. It just cuts straight to, like, the main focus of the film. Yeah. And same with Bride Frankenstein. So I, I appreciate that yeah. the films can do what the book couldn't yeah. necessarily. Like things like the light being brought to life by a bolt of lightning. That it's alive, it's alive. It's, it's like, alive. stuff that's not in it's the alive. book. So the film picks up... Immediately, immediately. where the first one left, left off. Yeah, yeah, it leaves off. Uh, where Frankenstein and the monster... Because, you know... The monster is not called Frankenstein. No, this is a big issue across cinema. Like, yeah. this is a... It causes a lot of confusion. They both survive. And yes. And the monster, is fle- he's basically chased through the woods. Yeah, he survives being burnt at the mill at the very beginning of this film. A yeah. lot of the townsfolk want to believe he's dead, but no, he actually survives yeah. the burning. He actually looks like he's damaged, he's wounded. One thing I really like about the 
makeup effects on Frankenstein throughout this. Like, they look great anyway. Boris Karloff is great. You didn't want the monster to speak, did he? No, he had issues with that. Yeah, even though it is in the book, but... It is so in the book. So he doesn't say that much. He doesn't say a lot, but it's impactful what he does say. It is impactful, but yeah. as the film goes on, his wounds kind of change as if they're healing. Yeah. And it's just a touch, like, back then, especially the way they were watching it, you probably wouldn't have been able to notice it. We're watching it, like, high def. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the basic, should we talk a bit about like the what the basic plot of this yeah. movie is, just to for starters. So, um, obviously the the Bride of Frankenstein. This film focuses on the little subplot of the of the novel where the the, the creature, the monster, wants a mate. He wants he wants a partner wants, to save himself from being lonely. He wants a companion because everyone in the world hates him. But unlike the novel. This film introduces a totally new character into the mix, Dr. Pretorius. And he's a very odd character. Interesting yeah. character to say the least. So I think in the in the film, Pretorius was once upon a time Dr. Frankenstein's tutor. Um and somewhere between the first film and this film, Pretorius has heard of Frankenstein's achievement in creating a man, but you know, making creating a man back from the dead. And now Pretorius is like, well, let's go one step further. You know, you brought a man back to life. Now let's make him a woman. Let's make him a partner. Yeah, because that's what Pretorius is all about. One of my favorite scenes, like, because Pretorius has created life, but he's created small people. He's good, but he's grown them from scratch. A monkey lie. But he can't. He can't do this. Do it on a scale. He needs Victor Frankenstein. He needs Frankenstein to help him. Yeah. And this. What like this is a VFX shot that I find absolutely outstanding when he pulls oh. the, like they're in little jars and it's like oh maybe it's false perspective but they're in, they're in glass jars they're interacting with the glass and you see his hand refracting as it goes behind and then it's like oh this one's now underwater this one's climbing out it's like, for the it's... time this looks absolutely insane and when we looked at how they did so they he has you can kind of see it when he pulls them out because initially you can see that it's an empty jar he has mm. jars on set for him to interact with and that's how you get that refraction with mm-hmm. his hand behind like behind it with my hand movements are helping to stay away <laughs> yeah. then they had giant jars with the actors in bell jars yeah giant yeah. bell jars they had to match the camera angle perfectly film it on against like uh, black felt and expose yeah. it so then we placed them over the top it was like this very very early form of visual effects that would still look outstanding that would have been so much work i think yeah you were kind of a little bit flawed when you when i saw it i was like that is insane yeah it, it does look incredible i mean you know this film is 1935 it's over 90 years old and that shot it, holds up really well yeah that it is really cool and yeah. i think one of the characters in the jars is henry the eighth who's trying to get into another jar where where a woman is yeah. <laughs> he's like desperately trying to get in and there's a ballerina i think as well there's a ballerina there's a mermaid yeah. so you got some cross species going on there there's a, it's, a vicar or something like there's, that yeah or? it's like it's such an odd little sequence and it ha- but it has a little bit of humor in it and i think that is sort of you know th- this film especially very campy and there is a, an odd sort of sense of humor yeah. to it and i think that does go back to james well the director wanting and demanding that creative control like yeah. he got to have a lot of fun with this at the same film. time though there's some really interesting camera angles the lighting yeah, there it, is. it looks like a hot like a better quality than a lot of the other universal films coming out at the time yeah definitely and boris Karloff gets mo- i know you may you may not have wanted the monster to speak but he gets a lot more time to sh- you know stretch yeah his to do his do his thing and do yeah. his thing and in the obviously in the novel, uh, Frankenstein learns to speak by watching a family. Mm. Over so time. none of that is in the in the first film. And we have the blind man sequence where obviously he's been chased through, chased through the woods. He's been arrested and he's just tired. Like yeah. he just wants to. A lot rest of scenes that and... represent those can be mirrored, like Christ on the Christ on the cross well, when he's uh, tied up. Yeah, I mean, religion comes into play a lot when you talk about Frankenstein. Yeah. It's talked about in the novel a lot. And then, you know, even in the first film, you know, the famous lightning sequence where it's alive, it's alive, you know, now I know what it's like to be God. I, You know, I've created a man, you know, now I know what that power is yeah. like. And then it's kind of maximised in this as, as well. We get a lot of imagery of the creature being yeah. strung up, almost like a weird crucifixion. Yeah, but he, he escapes prison runs off again he hides with a blind man for a bit because everyone assumes they see him they're scared of him they're horrified of him yeah. blind man has no reason to be afraid of him can't see him 
He can't see he it. He has no so idea spend, he's talking like, to a dead man. <laughs> an amount of time together. And those scenes are always, they're sweet. This is the first kindness he's ever been mm. shown. Mm-hmm. But it's also, you know, we see the creature drinking wine. Smoking. Yeah, he, apparently he's, the creature likes cigars. The <laughs> thing is, he's a man. He had, the brain he has belonged to somebody. Yeah, just a bit of a dodgy brain. Yeah, he's... He is just a man. He is a man. He's mistreated. Yeah. And, you totally. Know, it's sad that he had a friend. He did have a friend. And it does end in tragedy. That was taken away. Like everything else, like it everything. was just robbed away from him. And so when he comes across Pretorius. Yes, which is one of my favourite scenes actually yeah. in the so film. He's doing his grave robbing, but deciding to... There's well, a reason we have the... He's... He has a little, sharing. A, he's sharing a bottle of wine with a pile of skulls. He has like a little candlelit dinner in this tomb in this crypt. Yeah. He's just having a whale of a time down and there by himself. In walks the creature. Joins him. The and monster. <laughs> the, I, yeah. I've just done a death. I think the monster joins the him. The creature joins it, and yeah, the creature slash monster. And Pretorius is just so nonplussed by this. He's like, "Oh, come on here, come and have a drink. Go, yeah. go come and chill. I'm, I'm about to so choose your missus for watch. you." Like him and Boris Karloff in the same scene. It's just, it's great. So yeah, because Frank. Victor Frankenstein, he doesn't want to make another creation. He basically gets away with what he's done scot-free. Mm. Mm. And his Pretorius uses the monster to force him to yes. make him a mate. Because the monster's like, like we said, the monster is lonely. He is lonely. He wants his only friend. He wants a friend. He wants is now a... gone. Yeah, that's totally true. And I, I find the arc of, of Frankenstein interesting across the two films. Because like the first one, you know, he is very much the mad scientist, like, you know, mad with power. And then in this in this film, the the guilt and the realization of what he's done sort of takes over. You know, now he doesn't want anything to do with the experiments. He just wants to get married to his fiance, or like you know, live with his. I can't remember if they're engaged they're or married, actually married. Yeah. He just wants to be with his wife. But it's it's Pretorius who is very much the catalyst for this. He's like yeah. almost like you know the Mephistopheles figure, like you know, trying to seduce him back into the science yeah. and the experiments of it. Because Frank, he is also curious as well. He is curious. What um, I also found interesting, because the book, oh, I, we have to relate to the book. The book is essentially a book about bad parenting. Mm. Uh, yeah. Frank, the monster, bad family. still sees Victor as his dad, mm -hmm. as his father. As his creator. He refers to him as father. Yeah, he does. Yeah. He doesn't, and he doesn't hate him. No, he doesn't there's hate a, him. There's a, like, without saying it, I think he still has a love and affection for the, the man it's who created him. very troubled uh, father-son relationship, to yeah. say the least. Yeah. Um, I really the, the guy that plays Pretorius, who is essentially kind of the main character in this yeah. film. The, the, Frankenstein himself sort of takes a bit of a back a back step in this. Yeah, I think that was a lot to do with the um, the actor that played Frankenstein, um, Colin Clive. He was a great actor. Unfortunately, he had a lot of uh, alcohol problems. Alcohol problems, which f literally forced him that you know they, they couldn't use him a lot in scenes. And I think if you watch the film, you'll notice he's sitting down a lot. And I think that is because he literally, like, he had to sit down. He couldn't yeah, he really... Yeah, he caused a lot of an issue. He nearly lost his leg at one point. Yeah. It's sad. It like, was really a lot bad. of sad stories related he... to the people that work on yeah. these films. But so Pr Pretorius is, is the main character, essentially. And he's played by a guy called Ernest Th Thesiger? Th Thesiger? Great actor, you know, very, very theatrical. You know when you watch old movies and there's it's clearly... It's like watching a play. It is like watching a play. There's a very, you know, like, over-the-top melodramatic style that they have they talk very differently it's very exaggerated you know very exaggerated yeah. it is very melodramatic like a play because i guess all these actors they would have come from a theatrical background yeah um but he camps it right up and he is he is great yeah he is really good so the well the character that the film is named after basically isn't in the film not that much not that much no he appears every now and then, but he's not a main character in this film. No, I mean the bride. Oh, the bride. The bride, yeah. The bride is basically in it for like the end. That that's it. Surprised me, I because I'd never seen this film before watching it. Yeah. You know when we watched it together, and I yeah she is in how it. How iconic she is because she's never appeared since. No, and as the bride, she doesn't have any dialogue. No, she like what's her name? It's something Lancaster. Elsa Lanchester. Lanchester, because she also she plays a dual role. She does. In the opening scene, she plays Mary Shelley. Yes. Because the, the, the way of explaining is, oh, the story mustn't have ended there. So she's like, oh, no, it doesn't end there. And goes on to tell this story. Yeah, it kind of... That's put... their way of following it on. Yeah, which I, I actually like. I quite like. So she also plays the bride. Yeah, she has she a dual role. stilts. She had to wear stilts. And there is a, a scene before she's, you know, revealed 
where she's completely bandaged up and the actress literally had to be, you know, totally... Yeah. I can't even imagine how claustrophobic that, that would have been. But, I mean, it seems like she was a trooper. Oh, yeah. To do it. But, yeah, it's so iconic. The look of her, you know, with the lightning bolts in the hair and, you know, like, the really kind yeah, of, like... Yeah, so the difference is, rather made up of dead bodies, apart from, apart from the brain, maybe, unless they've grown up... Because she's been grown rather yeah. than... It's, it's strange because they, they clearly messed up with the creature um, badly. Like, he is not... You know, he's so different body parts. He's stitched, flat head than everything. And then you have the bride, who is, yeah, she's dead, but she is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, facial. She is absolutely... Well, is she actually dead, then? Because she's not made of body parts. She's a new... She's kind of a new corpse, isn't she? Yeah. Well, not a new corpse. Like, she's a new being that just needed life put into it. Put into it. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's Yeah, it's interesting, though. Like, she, she is... She's gorgeous. Oh, she is. And she's he's just, like, meanwhile, he's just sitting there like, well, where's remember, my she bride? She based a performance off swans, didn't she? She, she did. Yeah, it's very, like, erratic hissing. movements, like, lots of head jerks, and she hisses. Um, and, yeah, the, the actress Elsa Lanchester, in preparation for the role, she was a British actress, and she was walking in Regent's Park, and she saw a bunch of swans just you know, fucking, like, going for it, like, fighting each other. And she, she based her performance off that, you know, kind of saying that, Swans, although very regal, very elegant, very vicious. beautiful, vicious little bastards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, she has no lie. Just hisses and a scream. Yeah. So she, she's yeah. Start as to be expected in this. She rejects the monster as well. Yeah, she does not want to be married <laughs> to no. this creature, and um, and then yeah, the creature and because he's you know fairly vocal at this point, and doesn't he say something like you know we all belong dead. Yeah. He like he totally kind of gives up at that point. We all belong dead. We all belong dead. There's no hope for him. So, yeah, the film... We're giving spoilers, right? The yeah. very it, end. The film's nearly 100 years old. <laughs> so the film ends where um, a fire breaks out. Does the creature start the, the fire? The creature starts the fire. And he traps himself, the bride, and Pretorius in the yeah. laboratory. La- laboratory. Frankenstein and his wife. He lets Frankenstein go. That's what he calls him father. Yeah. He says, "No, not you. You can. Yeah. You can go. You deserve to live, but we belong dead, which is very kind of." You stay. We belong dead. Ah. Ah. Oh, that's it. Doctor Frankenstein deserved to die. Yeah, I and mean, Frankenstein is such a. I don't. I never liked him in the book. It's, the thing that really bugged me, and I'm sorry, I know this is going off on like a tiny little tangent now, but you know, he spent all this time looking at this creature, creating this creature, and then as soon as the creature comes to life, he instantly is repulsed by it. How? <laughs> it's like, you've been looking at this thing for months, and you now you're only just disgusted by what it looks like? It just didn't make any sense to me. Though. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, um, there's, there is a lot of... It, it's emotional, the ending, but like we were saying, there is a lot of wry humour in, in this film, like the creature drinking wine and smoking cigars, the candlelit dinner. We also have a character called Minnie, who is Frankenstein's housekeeper. God, I hate Minnie. And you hated her. She's, she's so annoying. It's such a bizarre little performance. She's and in it, the first one, isn't she? Yeah, again, you know, how much of it can you put to, well, you know, the acting style back then was very yeah. specific, it was very different to how much of it is just outright fucking annoying yeah but yeah it's um i i think i just put it down to the time it was made you yeah. wouldn't get a performance like that today i don't think well, any of the not. actors would act like this today i like to think boris Karloff would still play the character the same today yeah to a new world of gods and monsters that's a great line yes that's something pretorius toasts might, to yeah i might even call the video that gods and monsters a new world of gods and, mon- gods and monsters yeah um a lot has been said in this film about queerness because the director was he was he was a uh, james whale was was gay he was he was yeah. openly gay he was openly gay which for um, the time as well very unusual yeah. he was also you know he he was accepted he was getting lots of work done it yeah. did not affect his work at all but lots of people well i say lots of people I, I guess some critics and academics have looked into this film and they've said you know there's a lot of there's, there's a lot of subtext there um and the film in a way kind of becomes almost like a gay parable and people point to certain scenes like the blind man, you know, the hermit and the creature living together in kind of this blissful domesticity 
only for it to be taken away from them because society can't allow yeah. two men to live together. Arguably, you know, I'd just say they're friends. There's nothing sexual there at, at all. Um, and then people also point to Pretorius and Frankenstein as, you know, almost same-sex parents creating a new baby in a way and arguing over how it should be I mean, raised. Uh do, do you want to do the quote from uh, the director's partner? Yeah, uh, James Whale, one of his partners and uh, companions, David Lewis, he said, Jimmy, James Whale, Jimmy was first and foremost an artist and his films represent the work of an artist, not a gay artist, but an artist. So I think David Lewis's point was, you know, yeah, he was gay, but, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that all those things that you're looking for are there. Yeah. I, he was I just a good filmmaker. Some stuff in there because oh, most yeah. people create from the su- what they're subconscious. They know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, they, it's interesting. So like Pretorius and Frankenstein being the same sex and creating yeah. a bride, creating a daughter. Yeah, I, I could kind of see that. Like, there probably is some stuff in there, but some of it seems to be a bit stretching. I think f- film is ultimately very subjective. It's like if you want to look for something, you'll inevitably find it. It doesn't necessarily mean it was you're intended to find it but if you you know if you want to see it yeah you can interpret it in lots of different ways there's a lot of for and against here yeah it can be interpreted anyone can interpret it any way they like yeah of course they can it doesn't take away from it's just a really good film it's a bizarre film with a lot of really, it is i mean it not a lot of this film should be good like some of it's really bizarre but at the same time yeah. like, it just adds to yeah this package of weirdness. But it is a package of weirdness. Yeah. And like, and we, I think we noticed this when we watched Creature from the Black Lagoon as well. Back then, films just ended. Yeah. The big event would happen. There's no yeah. wind down afterwards. It doesn't like, dwell on anything. It's just done. done. End. So it's finished. Like the bride herself is so iconic. From, you know, like a few minutes of screen time. Yeah. With no, no dialogue. dialogue. I, I assume she'd be a big part throughout the entire film. Yes. Yeah, I know it's like the creation of her. It's, yeah, it's... Is the, the climax of the film. Exactly, exactly. Which is, you know, very, very interesting. That, but that shows, like, how well the build... Like, for me, the build-up in the story leading up to creation. To create such an iconic character. And then just end. Yeah, and exactly. And still be remembered. Exactly. It's, this many years later. I think the film... I mean, I would like to look at the sequels as well. that like Because this is a sequel, but there were more Frankenstein movies that came I after this as Boris well. I believe Boris Karloff only played the monster one more time. Son of Frankenstein. Yeah. Right? I think, didn't he play him when he, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, which is a comedy a few years later? Maybe. I know at one point, in, uh, many, many years later, he actually played Victor Frankenstein. Did he? Yeah. Okay. And Yeah. I yeah. Well, I mean, he I, said after the after the third one, he didn't think he could take the character any that's further. That's fair. Yeah, that, yeah, I think that's totally fair. I think I the mean, second one was also a push for him because he didn't think he could take the character any further. But this, I said, I personally, I will, I believe that this is a better film. Lo- lots of people do. You know, when when you look at you know the best Frankenstein adaptations, this comes out on top. Yeah, it's this fantastic. Is, this is constantly, you know, seen as number one. And I do sometimes wonder with old movies, you know, especially when it comes to a modern audience, do we do we love it because we genuinely love it? Or is it more of like, yeah, it's it's old, but we kind of have to respect it? Yeah. Is I it think, a little bit of both even? I don't know. I think know. it's a little bit of both. Considering we watch this for the very first time. I think we can... We have no prior attachment to no, this No, that's film. true. I think we can both agree... We just watched it and... Enjoy, we just enjoyed it. Yeah. Films adapt over time. Like, the style evolves over time. Directing, acting, you know, it's just ev- everything evolves as it should. This is not a film that you would see made today. If it was made today, it would be a totally different mm. movie. But, you yeah. know, you've got to also appreciate that you will never see the likes of this it's again. Just, it baffles me. It's been so long, but we've not seen... Just, the closest we've seen to The Bride of Frankenstein making a big screen, big screen appearance again is Hotel Transylvania. Yeah, weirdly. It's like, why has she, why she not had a film yet? Especially with the Universal Monsters having a bit of a reprisal. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, going back to what we were saying before, that we're not the biggest fans of Frankenstein as a story. But I think for me, I tend to prefer Frankenstein adaptations when it's not a straight up adaptation. Yeah. I like it when it's sort of Hollywood's parodied. always done interesting things with the character. Or just like the general idea of it. You know, like when it's parodied, like in Young Frankenstein or, you know, Hotel Transylvania, when he's like, he's there, but he's not a main character. Or, you know, even when you get, yeah, stories that are inspired by it. Yeah. Like Edward Scissorhands. 
It's it's yeah, inspired that, by Frankenstein. Yeah, massively. A uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show is a is a Frankenstein kind of tale. And I have to say, one of the greatest episodes of the X Files is inspired by Frankenstein, the postmodern Prometheus, which is actually the uh, the the subtitle of Frankenstein. It is, yeah. Postmodern Prometheus does an excellent X Files episode that was filmed in black and white as well. And that I'm is up, also about. I'm up to season three, like, give me t- give me a chance. <laughs> we've been on season three for a while, David. Give me. That's all I'm saying. But yeah, I, I that's just like personal preference. I don't necessarily like straight up adaptations because I think Kenneth Branagh did one, didn't he, in the nineties? It's not. It's as close to a straight up adaptation as we're gonna get. And I, it's not terrible, but I, I just, personal taste. I just prefer did it Kenneth when Branagh it's. Did Kenneth Branagh have to be shirtless when he created the monster? No, of course he didn't. <laughs> but <laughs> of Kenneth course Branagh. he didn't. Yeah, <laughs> it's just Ken Branagh being Ken Branagh. But yeah, I, I kind of like it when the stories sort of are very much their own thing. Just like a little sprinkle of the, the Frankenstein tale yeah. so thrown in there. What else is on your list of notes? Um, did we talk about budget and box office? No, we actually, did. we actually didn't. So um, budget for this film was very specific, $397,000. And it made $2 million, Which but, I have no idea what that is in today's money. That was insane. Two million back in nineteen thirty five, you know, pre World War Two, God knows. Um, but yeah, this this film, from what I can gather, is is heralded as one of the perhaps the greatest Frankenstein movie of, of all time. From the ones I've seen, I'd I'd agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really it's just a, you know, we said as we were watching it as well, you know, I bet, I bet you anything when they were making this film back in nineteen thirty five, they had no idea that in twenty twenty two people would be able to watch this on their television. People would still be interested in watching yeah. this movie. And it there's something just so crazy about that to me. Yeah. It's like no one, as far as I know, no one from that film is still alive today. Everyone has passed away. Cast yeah. and crew. And yet we're, we're still watching it. We're still, still watching talking it. about it. We want to we uh, watch a lot more of these older films, especially the Universals and the Hammer Horrors. The monster movies. The monster movies. This is kind of where it began. So this, for us, this will be the first of hopefully many that we end up doing. This is definitely the oldest uh, horror we've done so far. Yeah, oh, 100%. Uh, our aim is to inspire at least one person to seek yeah. out one of these films. Go and see this film. And don't be I'm one of those... I'm pretty sure this one's... Uh, we rented it on Amazon Prime, but I'm pretty sure it's all on YouTube. I think it probably is. I mean, like, yeah. it, this is a, it's a film that's easy to come by. Yeah. You know, it's it's that famous, you will find it somewhere. And the thing is, like, it's so famous, you probably already know a lot of the film. Yeah, I mean, I popular culture. I knew the, the bride's look. I knew what she looked like. Yeah. I did, was not aware for how little screen time we would get of her, but yeah. Yeah, yeah it's it's definitely worth it. Yeah. And it's not a long film either. No, it's not. It's not at all. It was actually <laughs> criminally short. Yeah, but that's like, again, it's typical of films back then. It's like, let's just get to the point and let's finish. Yeah. Done. Film expensive. <laughs> film what, what, show what you want to show. Yeah, exactly. Done. We've got one take to do this, guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got it. I, you know, respect. I respect that. Yeah. yeah. It tells the story it wants to tell, and then it just it finishes. It yeah. ends very abruptly. But yeah, nearly a hundred years later. Yeah. We're still watching this film. Yeah. And we've not seen the bride make a, li- a live action appearance, as far as I'm aware. No. But in big films, definitely not. But I, I'd be interested if they ever were to make another Frankenstein movie. I'd be well up for another Bride of Frankenstein. I think it would be interesting. If they ever did a straight-up remake of this, yeah, I'd yeah. be interested for sure. Maybe do a film where Frankenstein is already... Because we know the story of Frankenstein. We don't need to we see it retold again. We don't need another one. Yeah, so maybe yeah. if they do a film set in a world where Frankenstein already exists. Yeah, that would be good. Like Frankenstein's monster already exists. It's just about the Bride yeah. creating the mate. But they got to try and keep that look. Because it's just iconic at this yeah. point. But yeah, thank you for stopping by. Yeah. And for coming back in time watching us, us in black and white. Yeah. I'm definitely having to do the black and white now. I've mentioned it twice. You, yeah. 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 And yeah, please check out this film and mm-hmm. below in the comments, let us know what Universal or Hammer Horror films you want us to watch. Like 100% I want to do Creature from the Black Lagoon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Are we sure. even doing The Curse of Frankenstein with Christopher Lee? Oh, and Peter Cushing. Yeah. yeah. That, was, that was fun. I enjoyed that one. I I love Cushing's take on the Frankenstein character. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. Can I really want to, I've not seen the original Wolfman. No. I want to do I want to do a a versus with the uh oh, 2000 the 2010, 2010 one. Yeah, the one. Benicio del Toro. Yeah. Okay. 
All right. Two very, very different films. We, we'll do... I mean, I desperately want to start Hammer. Yeah. That, that's coming. We're just kind of like... Testing the waters. We're testing the waters a little bit. And yeah, putting them like... We're reserving certain films for a specific point in time as well. Yeah. So we'll get there. We'll get there. So yeah, uh, like I said before, thank you for stopping by. And we will see you next week. 